Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for this update on our new graduation requirements coming out of House Bill 1599. Just FYI, we have set a record for webinar registrations at 994 today, almost meeting our 1000 max. So we really appreciate this opportunity that you are giving all of us to have a chance to connect with so many of you firsthand. So my name is Kim Rakedahl and I am your current OSPI program supervisor lead for school counseling. And I'm Linda Drake. I'm with the State Board of Education. I'm the director of Career and College Readiness Initiative. So we know that there are a lot of questions about 1599 and what's on the screen are some of the ones that we have heard from you as we've begun provided, providing trainings and implementation support. But our goals is really to leave you with an understanding of the intent behind this language in the bill, how we all must keep equity in serving students at the center of our work to prepare them for a meaningful first step after high school. You should leave with a better understanding of all the new pathways, which are now in rule, such as what counts and what is required to do. You also leave with an understanding of areas of change for the high school and beyond plan, such as how we will serve students with IEPs, how we will utilize state assessment scores to inform junior year course taking decisions, and the additional component of financial aid information for all, as well as other modifications to existing graduation requirements. So as many of you who have heard OSPI staff say, we are grounding all of our work on the foundations of our vision, mission, and values. The intent of building the new graduation pathways was truly to deliver on this promise of our vision that all students leave our schools ready for a meaningful first step after high school. And then our equity statement, which is a lot of words, but it is really the driving force in highlighting how we are guiding our work every day to ensure that we make equity live and breathe in how we support you. Implementing these new graduation requirements will definitely require us to be even more intentional in changing policies and practices and breaking down systemic barriers that are keeping all students from preparing to leave our system ready for that next step. We are ready to support you in this work, and it will not be easy, but it is imperative that the adults in our system work to build in new opportunities to better serve all students. And let's talk a little bit about some of not only the foundational values that are guiding this work, but some of the data that is evident as we look at this graduation scenario in our state, these changes that have come about with 1599. So for those of you like me who are visual learners and really like to kind of see the why behind this bill, one of the many ways we can see a need to change our system to better serve all students is to look at our graduation rates. And that's what's reflected on the screen here in front of you. This slide shows the class of 2018, which is our most current data, what their current four-year rate disaggregated by rate and gender looks like. In the middle column is actually the percent of students that we see continuing in our system past that fourth year. And then the last column is our dropout rate. As we begin to try to dismantle systemic barriers and really build more opportunities for students to prepare for that meaningful next step after high school, we should expect to see lots of positive outcomes across the system, including higher percentages on a slide like this. As we look at other ways that we disaggregate our data and focus on student groups that we know need more time and attention in order to successfully navigate our system, we see similar results in our percentages of students who are persisting beyond that fourth year and those who are leaving our system before they graduate. We need a shift in this data as much as we need a shift in the left-hand column of overall graduation rates, which will require how we think about year five, year six, year seven, and how we are working together to support students who need that additional time. Even in a perfectly equitable system, if we ever reach that lofty goal, some students will need more than four years to be ready to leave us. Together, we can focus on moving students away from dropping out and keep them in our schools, progressing towards their goals, no matter how long it takes for them to get to what they need to do. We think it's so important to ensure that, that students know we will support them as long as needed, that we've even redesigned our school recognition system 
in collaboration with the State Board of Ed and the Oversight and Accountability Committee, EOGOAC. We are now highlighting schools that are keeping students moving forward, even beyond that year four and showing that growth. This is one of the ways in which we hope to highlight this kind of opportunity for our students as much as we highlight our four-year on-time grad rates. So the aspiration of 1599 really requires us to significantly shift our thinking as the adults in buildings and running the systems that support students. Our own beliefs and biases, as well as those impacting our students and families, have got to be part of what we work to change as we remove the systemic barriers that are impacting our students and put in place more options to meet their unique needs. While these shifts may be hard in some areas, in others, we are simply needing to do more of what is already working. We know from evidence-based practices and research that supporting and guiding students towards designing their high school experience and connecting it to what they hope for after school can greatly increase their engagement with their learning and their persistence in reaching their post-high school goals. In order to increase student access to relevant preparation for their goals, how we message graduation pathways and all of the amazing post high school options that we can inspire students to pursue to meet a career goal or access more education and training after high school, that's going to be a critical part of this system shift. And that's across all educators. So while there is certainly an imperative right now, and we know you feel it, to make this new system work for this year's seniors, and we'll talk about ways in which we can do that, we do still have options to help them move forward. And even maybe more importantly, we also need to start thinking about building the future we hope to see with changes for our juniors and beyond. Changes to master schedules, increasing middle school transition processes, how we allocate resources and funding, what our staff professional development needs are, and how we message post high school options to all students. This is a big lift. But there are really many state agencies and organizations that are providing information and resources that complement what we are here to share with you today. Remember, we are your implementation support team and we are here to help. So sort of the guiding question for today's conversation is on the screen. How are we going to make sure that each and every student has a clear path for after high school, starting with that first year after graduation? This really is the question that's at the heart of our conversation about 1599 today as it relates to implementing the requirements and the aspiration of this new graduation pathway policy. When we really think about our sphere of influence and where we as K-12 educators can have the most impact for students as they leave our schools, we truly believe that it is with that first step after graduation. So that is where we can have the biggest impact around making sure that our adults are set up for future success. So just as a quick overview, what you see on the screen now are the three graduation requirements that are in place for the class of 2020. The new pathways are built off things already in place that we know prepare students for that next step. For the High School and Beyond plan, we're going to clarify and strengthen the role that it plays in helping students explore their post-high school career ideas and connect back to the courses they can take. 1599 affirms the belief that quality core instructions that all of our students receive matters. And finally, the assessment has been removed as a graduation requirement to instead provide a greater variety of ways in which students can be guided to prepare and demonstrate their readiness for a meaningful first step after high school. So you will notice our equity theme is going to start showing up more and more as we continue to progress through these slides. In particular, we, we need to really think about how we're going to enhance the current system to ensure that our students with disabilities receive the access and inclusion into the general education program that we know from extensive research and data analysis truly ensures better outcomes. There are still additional options available for them to help with the transition to these graduation pathways, but for the class of 2020, we should be making every effort to utilize what's available as pathways already for students, knowing that there are these options as you see on the screen in the short term as we transition to this new system. Moving forward though, as we build more pathway options, just know that the WA AIM will remain an option 
for our students who have significant cognitive challenges, but that certificate of individual achievement is set to sunset right now with the class of 2021. We know again, this may be a heavy lift for many districts. So OSPI is working to deploy really significant professional development opportunities for inclusionary practices and provide lots of technical assistance and support for districts that need additional help in providing that more inclusive environment. So when we think about graduation pathways, I hope we will think about them as really opportunities to prepare students for that meaningful first step after high school. We see them as equal in value and expectations and that there definitely needs to be that connection to their post high school goal as reflected in their high school and beyond plan. And we'll talk more about that later. What graduation pathways are not is alternatives to the high school assessment anymore. So I hope you will take that phraseology, put it in your long-term file box and lock the door. Because really this is about open pathways for all students that are meaningful and help prepare them for what they wanna do. We also wanna make sure that this does not become a way to track students. Obviously we know we will be tracking data and information, but this is not a way to funnel students into any specific pathway. We want them to have access to as many as possible. And finally, you'll hear us say this over again, that we are not seeing these pathways as new boxes to check for graduation. These really should be guiding decisions throughout the whole process. So what you see on your screen now is our transition slide. This is just a visual of the resource that is one of the resources in our graduation pathways toolkit. For visual learners, it gives you a way of looking at how we've sort of aligned some of the ways in which students might be thinking about that first step after graduation and the pathways that might be best able to prepare them for that post high school goal. And then of course you see the additional options that are still in place for our students receiving special education services through the class of 2021. And I'm gonna hand it over to Linda and she is going to take you through all of the new SVE rules and points of guidance around the new pathways. All right, thanks Kim. So the State Board of Education was directed by 1599 to write rules uh, for the graduation pathway options. And those rules were adopted by the board at their November board meeting. Uh, where the bill may lack some detail, the rules are intended to interpret and clarify the statute. The rules are supposed to provide useful and necessary information for the implementation of the bill. So there are eight pathways and they should, as Kim said, relate to the high school and beyond plan and all the pathways are intended to be of equal value. Uh, so over the next few slides, I will go over each of the pathway options with some details about each of them. So the CTE graduation pathway was the most discussed when it came to our rulemaking process. The pathway option is met by a CTE sequence of courses or by completing a core plus program. The CTE sequence must consist of two credits of courses that include dual credit or lead to a career credential. The sequence may be in a single CTE program area or in more than one program area. If the sequence is in more than one program area, then the sequence must be approved locally and by OSPI through an expedited approval process. And just one question I received first thing this morning, Linda, when we talk about the CTE program areas, remember there are six of them. And so when we're looking at the sequence of courses, those courses need to be within that program area to be directly approved. And we'll talk now about the process for if they're out of program. Right, if they are sep two separate, yep. two or more separate you know, but program But those program areas. areas are broad. And so mm -hmm. they may be in different subject areas within the same program. Mm -hmm. program area. Yeah, I mean this was this was this option was designed for kids that might want, you know, a particular pathway where they wanted to take entrepreneurship and some other program area. So for those where there is more than one CTE program area, we're calling those local CTE graduation pathway sequences. Those need to be locally approved by a school board or designee of the school board or the local CTE advisory. OSPI has developed a form for submitting approval and OSPI will respond within 45 days. Once approved, the sequence may be used by other districts without an additional approval process. You just need to notify OSPI that you are using it. The next most discussed pathway was the military pathway or the ASVAB pathway. This is a pathway for students who have an interest in the military 
or an interest in a career that could be a military career. To meet this graduation pathway option, a student must meet standard on the Armed Forces Qualifying Test, or AFQT, portion of the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, or <laughs> ASVAB. The standard the board set is based on the minimum for entering any branch of the military. Currently, that is a 31. The board will post the score needed by September every year on the State Board of Education website, and we will re recheck that score in the spring. The military does change this from time to time, so that's why we wanted to have the posted score be the one that schools can, can refer to. Districts must inform students about the scores needed for each branch of the military and specific careers within the military. This can be done through a free to the district and students career exploration program that is provided by the military. I've heard really good things about that program and I think it's a good tool that I would encourage districts mm -hmm. to consider using. Districts are also uh, required to inform students how their information may or may not be shared with the military and students need to be given an option to opt out of whatever agreement the school yeah. has with the military. So I know, Linda, one of the questions that come up has come up about this particular pathway is in alignment with high school and beyond plans and what that might look like. And what we have talked about this week and, and that uh, we agree is that any student who's accessing the ASVAB as a graduation pathway, we would expect to see some kind of post high school goal that could be potentially related to military preparation for that career that would get them to that career possibility because employers and colleges and other options don't actually utilize ASVAB scores as an entry requirement, it makes most sense for this pathway to be utilized by students who are exploring that option. Who explore, right. Yeah. Right. And there are many, many careers, of course, available through the military. So it would be a good thing for a student to explore if they weren't sure to look at possible military Oh yeah. Careers. Great to give this test as an exploratory tool mm -hmm. earlier on. I think we're, we've mm -hmm. got questions often about what if they want to actually make that their pathway, what needs to be in their high school beyond plan. And I just want to be clear, right. we would expect to see something related to the military there right. if they're using that pathway. If a counselor were working with a student who absolutely knew they absolutely never in the, in the world would <laughs> consider going into the military, then this would not be the pathway for them. No, it's not, because it's not going to prepare them for right. anything else necessarily. It's not a gatekeeper for those other options. So this is a pathway that probably you are familiar with already, Smarter, Balanced, and WA AIM. Students to meet this pathway must meet the graduation score that was previously set by the State Board of Education. WA AIM is available for students with significant cognitive challenges. Now, one thing that I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard as well, yeah. is that districts are worried about students not wanting to take the, the mm -hmm. um, state tests anymore. Just to clarify, districts are required by state law to administer this test to all students. There is not an explicit requirement for students to take the test, but it is a good test. It's a good check for students and parents to make sure students are on track for career and college readiness, and there are advantages to taking the test. It can and should be used by schools and teachers to inform instruction. Also, it is used by higher ed in some placement agreements. And furthermore, of course, the tests and the participation rates are used for state and federal system accountability. Well, and not to mention that this could give students some greater flexibility in their junior and senior year if they've already met a grad pathway by the end of sophomore year and they Absolutely. know that they're eligible and ready for some of those other opportunities that come along as right. they progress through high school. And the state tests are uh, tied to acceleration policy. To and high school beyond planning, and which we'll talk about in a little minute. Right. Yep. Okay, the next pathway is the college admission exams. These are ACT and SAT. The graduation scores would be the standard for students to meet these pathways. Yeah, once again, one of those alternatives. It's no longer an alternative, but it's all the same as when it was an alternative, but now it's a pathway. Dual credit exams are pathways. These are AP, IB, and Cambridge. These are exams that have specified minimum scores for meeting the, the, uh, the pathway. The state board website and OSPI graduation pathways toolkit will have a list of the tests that, that meet this requirement. And then students who take the courses can also meet the pathway requirement by earning a C plus or better. 
these courses are the same courses as in the tests in the previous slide. And those, once again, are listed in the uh, OSPI Graduation Pathways Toolkit and on the State Board of Education website. The C plus we get questions about, they are, that that grade was actually specified in the bill itself. Yep. It's in statute, so that's where that lives. And wanted to point out before we move on, the 1.0 high school credit for advanced placement, we acknowledge that some of those courses are taught in a semester format. So if a student is wanting to use dual credit courses for their ELA pathway and or math pathway and they want to use those half credit courses, they could do it in combination. Mm -hmm. So as long as they put two of them together, that will still meet this graduation pathway and then they can use the course. Also, just to be clear, they do not have to take the test in order to meet this grad pathway, but they certainly would not be eligible for any college credit by just taking the course. And then other dual credit programs are also pathways to graduation. For CTE dual credit, college in the high school and running start, the student must earn at least one credit and it must be in high school math or high school English language arts and earn college level credit at the 100 course level or higher. Students are not required to pay any fees. They must meet all the requirements to earn the college credit, but do not actually need to enroll in the college or claim the college credit to meet this pathway option. So we've got kind of a significant shift in the CTE dual credit course. Do you want right. to share about that? Right. With the high school? Uh, previously to qualify as dual credit. dual credit, it needed to be a college level math or English course. Meet their requirements. Meet their requirements. Yes. For now, it only needs to be a math or English course at the high school and a 100 level course at the college. Which we should see reflected in those articulation agreements yes, that are in place. Yes, absolutely. So that's a little bit of a shift there. I wanted mm -hmm. to draw their attention to that one. And then transition courses. The Bridge to College course is the state-approved transition course, but we do want to acknowledge that the way the bill was written, it, it may be possible for local agreements to meet this as well, as long as through passing a course, the student is directly placed into a college level, 100 level or above mm -hmm. course at the college. Mm -hmm. And just would add to that, we're still thinking through the process that might need to be put in place to track those local agreement transition courses for our data reporting requirements. So you can expect some additional guidance from OSPI as we figure out how to make that happen as part of our required data reporting. Finally, these pathways can be used in combination. All of the ELA and math pathway options can be used in combination. For example, a student could meet ELA through a smarter balanced assessment and math through a CTE or a dual credit program. The CTE pathway option and the ASVAB pathway option are both standalone pathways. Now, for the class of 2020, your current seniors, for students who have not yet met a graduation pathway option, the expedited assessment appeal is available for these students. And to access that appeal, the students do not need to take another assessment prior mm -hmm. to accessing the appeal. So they have all of the pathways available to them that are available, that, that are available yep. Yep. plus the expedited assessment appeal. All right. And I would just add here too, that this was really the safety net that the legislature was willing to put in place in the implementation timeline that they wanted to see for House Bill 1599. So we know that this is a needed piece as we build a system to better meet student needs. And OSPI staff are, are still working to update our waiver submission process to align with 1599. So we will expect to see that portal for the EEA waiver ready by January. All right, now the State Board of Education has some extra follow-up that was assigned to the board by 1599. I think that the legislature sort of acknowledges that these pathways are not going to be perfect at first. They, it, there are going to be issues, there's going to be implementation issues and challenges and obstacles to implementing 1599. So the legislature knew this and they built in a way to revisit the pathways 1599 directed the State Board of Education to collect information about implementation of pathways from districts and other stakeholders. You may already have heard about focus groups that we'll be holding starting pretty soon. The board will be developing recommendations for possible additional graduation pathways 
for modifications of existing pathways or even the removal of a pathway. Your voice is important to informing decisions about these. The legislature in any session may look to change the pathways if they hear that there is significant issues, then certainly that is something they may, may consider. Sure. And, um, uh, the state board will be writing a final report on this by December 2022, but the board will be collecting information starting right away and will be doing interim reports every year. Well, and we're going to be collecting data ahead of this report too. So between Absolutely. our two agencies, we're going to be providing lots of information and it may not need to be that we wait until December of 2022 for some of those changes to happen. So that's great. So we've got a question around students being locked in when they maybe do that first career assessment in middle school and set that first goal for what they want to do in high school. Just want to reassure everyone that really this is meant to be about flexibility and ways for students to be able to change their mind are going to have to be implemented in this system. We certainly do not want to see any students feeling locked into any one pathway. Don't feel like this system needs to be set up in a way that's going to keep kids locked in. This is why the high school and beyond plan implementation really needs to become an integral part of our day-to-day -day operations with students and how we are messaging all these pathways and how this courses that students have access to can prepare them for a multiple of variety. They might meet more than one. Mm -hmm. Many of our students will. Do all students have to attempt the SBA before accessing alternative pathways? Anna. I'd say the answer is, is no. All students need to take the SBA because it's a state assessment, but students could attempt other, other pathways. That's right. So again, we're getting rid of that language around alternatives to the assessment, but we know that assessment plays a role in us being able to guide students, especially into that second half of their high school career, as we take a look at lots of information, not just mm -hmm. SBA scores, but how they're mm -hmm. doing in their coursework, what is actually in their high school and beyond plan at that point, and then what might be their opportunities going into that junior year that we could use those scores to help us inform those, those mm -hmm. choices. Okay, and so the last question we're going to field here real quickly, and then we're going to jump back into some more discussion and try to catch a few more at the end, is about extending the expedited waiver for the class of 2021. That is really a decision that can only be made by the legislature. And as we mentioned earlier, when we were talking about the reporting that the SBE is going to be doing, and when we were talking about the data reporting that OSPI needs to be putting forward as we go into building these systems, your voices are going to be key in helping us understand best from your perspective. What else are we missing? What else might we need to put in place? It appears unlikely that the legislature will amend the law this year, but again, we never know what will happen until the session is done. So mm -hmm. this is something that would be on their plate to try yeah. to make a decision about. So want to talk a little bit about OSPI's changing role when it comes to how we are implementing 1599. You're having significant shifts across the K-12 system in how you operate and to provide supports and opportunities for students. We're also changing our role when it comes to graduation. So we are no longer really in that accountability business, ensuring that all students have met standard on an exam or an alternative. We will no longer be providing information to districts about who is eligible to graduate through meeting a CAA or a CIA. That's done. Those are pathways now. They are no longer pieces of the puzzle for us to provide information about. And in this new system, OSPI is still not going to be the box checker. This agency will not be determining whether a student has fulfilled the requirements of a graduation pathway as is specified in their high school and beyond plan. Those decisions will now more fully rest with you, local district staff and school board. So we do play a role though in data and reporting. And even though OSPI will no longer inform school districts about an individual student's progress towards graduation, we will be providing districts information about graduation pathway access, and that is meant to support your work in meeting your students' needs. From a data standpoint, the majority of pathways are already in CEDARS. We are updating our data sharing agreements with the College Board, International Baccalaureate, ACT, et cetera, to get their data. But districts, you will always have that information sooner than OSPI can share back to you. 
The one exception is ASVAB scores. Uh, for now, those will likely be collected in grad alts through CEDARS until a CEDARS change for next year because there is no data sharing agreement with the Department of Defense and not likely to be one. So OSPI's goal is really to capture the required data in a manner that will minimize the administrative burden on districts, but still enable us to create a report for you to use that will allow you to see one, which pathways students have met in your district, in your region, across the state, and then to see clearly how we are compiling pathway participation data to meet our required reporting for House Bill 1599. So it will be transparent as best as we can make it so. Then when we talk about broader role that OSPI is really excited to be playing in the development of these new systems, it's really around programmatic supports. So our primary role in this new graduation pathways world is to partner with you to identify where you need to grow pathway access and to offer our programmatic supports and resources to help you improve delivery and access to different pathways. So we see this truly as a cross-agency lift here at OSPI. We've got our learning and teaching team growing access to transition courses, standards-based instruction that supports ELA and math proficiency, and our CTE division within that team has a bigger and brighter role in helping districts deliver CTE programming through sequences and equivalencies. We've got our dual credit team working to figure out with our partners in higher ed how to close significant gaps in dual credit access and improve funding. We have our special education team working to increase those inclusionary practices through professional development, ideally earlier than high school in our system, so that students who are served by IEPs aren't prevented from accessing any of the pathways they are capable of achieving. We have our school counseling team strengthening high school and beyond plan implementation practices across the state. Our data team, of course, is hard at work trying to make sure we can grow your data efficiency and use in the field while also meeting our new state requirements for reporting. And our assessment team is getting ready to focus on supporting assessment practices that are deeply embedded in learning and teaching and helping ed educators use that assessment data to inform their instruction. So as OSPI shifts to more of a programmatic support role and away from compliance, this really means that district and building roles that have been focused on that accountability and compliance regarding graduation are also probably going to need to change. So what else has changed for our students? Well, let me tell you, there's a few other things you need to be aware of. As with the new grad pathways, we also have a few changes to our current high school and beyond plan. You'll notice one of the changes I've heard the most about from school counselors anyway, is this idea that we're going to use the 10th grade SBA scores to inform those 11th grade course choices. So we acknowledge with you that the timing of that is a little problematic, but want to assure you that you can access preliminary data from those SBA scores within usually five to 10 days of completing the computer adaptive test and the performance test. Thank you, Deb the performance task. So that's essentially going to be one piece of your data set that will combine to do that sophomore year check that's now mandated within the high school and beyond plan to help inform those junior year course choices. Another significant shift is that the IEP transition plans are no longer allowed to be counted as a student's high school and beyond plan. They need to be aligned instead. And all of our students with disabilities are expected to be receiving the same tier one level of guidance and current college exploration as all the other students and with similar staff so that we can ensure we are increasing more equitable outcomes for our students in meeting those services. And our partners at WASAC, the Student Achievement Council, are going to be your best friends when it comes to providing all students with WASPA and FAFSA, our state and federal financial aid information. They have a team over there that has been working really hard to develop resources and, and have even hired a new staff member to provide additional support in this area. And I will reference their resources later in this presentation as well. And then one last thing, of course, to be aware of because it is coming up quickly, is that by next fall, all your students should have access to an electronic high school and beyond plan platform. We are still working here to create that list of vendors that have met all the state requirements and who are providing transferability ease. Uh, that should be ready for you in 2020 so that you can see 
where we've got vendors who have done that alignment, and then you'll make those choices about what's the best fit for your district. So some great things happening with high school and beyond plans. So thinking again around building systems of graduation pathways, many of us are thinking, how do we build that through high school? Well, how can we also build this down into the uh, middle schools is another question to be thinking about because we now have a new mandate that any students who are taking high school level courses in their middle school, we need to transcribe the credit that they earn onto their transcript for high school automatically. Now note, of course, that students and families will have the opportunity to opt out of either having it on there altogether or if they want to keep the class on there with the credit but change the letter grade to a pass, say, something non-numerical, they can do that. But all of those decisions have to be made by the end of 11th grade. This was designed to try to make sure we don't have any surprises in that senior year as we're trying to ensure that students are ready for graduation. And we wanna make sure you know districts that you need to go back and review and possibly update existing policy to now fit with this new mandate. We've also had the question, I think, Linda, about well, can students add it back on after they've removed it? Probably not the best practice. No, we're in agreement here and our guidance and, and high encouragement is going to be for districts to make this an opt-out only po um, policy as it is in statute, just to keep your registrars and counselors from pulling their hair out if nothing else. That's high school and beyond plan and kind of some credit updates. Now let's think about the broader 24 credits that are required for graduation, although some of us are still finishing out that two-year waiver that we took to give us a little more time. But this is how it should look in a visual form want to just do a quick reminder about the credits that are listed here in blue. Those are the 17 core credits. Core credits. Yes, so this is not core 24 people, it's core 17. Mastery-based work group anyway um, yeah. is something the legislature is interested in as a way of providing flexibility in graduation requirements. Yeah, so just to reiterate, the blue boxes on your screen here, those are our 17 core credits that have to be met in some fashion. CTE equivalencies, traditional instruction, could be our students with disabilities accessing those in a unique way. We also see the three flexible credits that are the personalized pathway requirement there in green. Again, those are opportunities for students to be able to use their post high school goals and their high school and beyond plan to basically say, I wanna take something different than what is required to meet my personal goals for after high school, great opportunities, and then the four electives rounds out the seven flexible credits. So the reason I wanted to reiterate that and, and make that really clear is so that this um, change in the two credit waiver is easier, hopefully, to understand. This, again, is for schools that are already adhering to the 24 credit diploma requirements that we just showed on the previous screen. The change that was made in 1599 to the two credit waiver is we removed the word unusual. And so now districts really need to think about what does our policy and our procedure need to look like for how we are going to consider student circumstances for these up to two credit waivers. So that's another area where you need to be making some concerted effort, board members, if you're on the call, to be getting this policy in place for your districts to have access to that and to make sure that we're only waiving any of the seven flexible credits, none of the 17 core. Just really quickly wanted to put up on the screen for you a really brief explanation of some changes that came to social studies credits, not necessarily out of 1599, but it was This was recommended connected. by OSPI mm -hmm. and the board endorsed it as a good idea to provide districts with a little extra flexibility that might help meet the civic requirement as a standalone course. Basically, contemporary world history changed from a one credit course to a half a credit and then the elective credit was increased to one. It's still three total social studies right. credits that are required. Districts may, if they choose, continue to teach contemporary world history as a one credit course. It just adds a little flexibility to other districts that may want to uh, fit in the civics in some way. Also, I wanted to mention that Jerry Price and I are planning a webinar on the social studies graduation requirements in early January, so please check the yep. social studies 
web page and this SDE web page for details on that. So you'll get more information on that one. Just wanted to bring it to your attention because I know many of you are building your course descriptions and catalogs for next year right now. So this gives you a little insight there. Wanted to also highlight for you another policy change that isn't coming until 2021. So you've got a little bit more time to figure this one out. And many districts have already actually adopted this policy. It first showed up in 2013. But really what is the shift here through 1599 is that we want to see students who are meeting or even exceeding standards on their SBA assessment results to have that opportunity to be enrolled in another more rigorous course, ideally leading to dual credit and that opportunity to build into some college options. But this really needs to be aligned with our high school and beyond plan. And that's the shift from 2013. So while we are wanting to give every student access to those opportunities, well, there may need to be some conversations with students as well about is this a good fit based on what we see in their high school and beyond plan and their post high school goals. And so again, you've got a little time to work on this policy, but it's coming up by 2021. So those are sort of our recap of all the changes to graduation requirements per 1599 and other legislation that passed this last session. So I want to just shift for a quick sec to talk about some of the next steps that we see being helpful as you leave this webinar here in the next 10 minutes or so and go back into your buildings and your districts like, what do we do now? So here's some next steps we would recommend. Obviously, you heard that there are some board policies and procedures that need to be added and or updated. So that's something to bring back pretty quickly. Some of those have some time constraints that are pretty short. Using your data, we would hope that you'd be looking at which of the pathways do you already offer. How many of your seniors haven't yet met the requirements of at least one pathway? We know a lot of school counselors and staff were kind of waiting for the final rules before they really dove in to see who's met and who hasn't. Now you have all the information, you should be able to make those determinations and then figure out what are the next steps for those who still need to meet a pathway. Maybe they need that expedited assessment appeals waiver. And then what about junior class? Because I know that's another area of concern, right? We've been hearing that like, okay, we'll get through the seniors, but our juniors, are they going to have enough time? So again, what additional opportunities can you be providing in that short term that can help with the junior class that could build on what you already have existing? And as you've seen the equity thread throughout this conversation, obviously we hope you're going back and figuring out ways to address your opportunity gaps. So what might we need to do differently to make sure students with IEPs, for example, have equitable access to a variety of pathways and have that ability to access general education classroom programming? How might we need to enhance high school and beyond planning to better inform students about all the post high school options and then how their course choices and their pathway decisions can actually prepare them for that first step? That's really what the foundational point is of the high school and beyond plan. And ultimately, that can even be percolating down into some vertical alignment with our middle schools, right? So that those students are coming in with some ideas of things they might want to try. Again, knowing they're going to change their mind, what would be some good exploratory places for them to begin? And what might you want to build into that eighth grade year too, right? right. Knowing that they can count some of that as high school credit. Thinking ahead... What kind of staff development might be needed to offer more pathway options? Especially we see a lot of questions around CTE there. You know, what, what do we do to get CTE teachers, more teachers certified to offer those opportunities? Once OSPI has to report our disaggregated data about which of our students are accessing pathways, what story do you want your district data to tell? How do you want that to be reflected? And when the State Board of Ed completes their report about maybe additional pathways needed or things that aren't working well, what might that look like? What would you want to consider adding or modifying? And then last, how can you leverage this legislation to really more intentionally focus on district goals around equity, access to CTE, building equivalencies and opportunities, and enhancing those community relationships so we're building opportunities that actually meet community demand? get kids into careers that actually have opportunity. And when you're stuck and you need help, this is where we're gonna come for help. Here's our last slide. These are some of the available state resources. I'll have Linda share out with you what the State Board of Ed is linked to here. We have a webpage on graduation pathways 
that includes the ASVAB pathway, and that also links to a specific ASVAB page where we will um, we'll keep the scores posted on both of those. And then, of course, we have the general graduation requirement for each class. For class, because we know it's different right. as we go. In OSPI, you can see a number of our resources here on the screen. We do have a House Bill 1599 page with lots of information, and our FAQ there will be updated after this webinar with some of the questions we don't get to today, because we will run out of time. Our graduation pathways toolkit, we're expecting to have that updated by January. We had hoped to have it today, but as with all big system shifts, we need time to make sure we get it right for you. And so we want to make sure we do that before we send it out. The CTE course sequence approval form is live and posted, and this will link you to that if you want to go grab that. And there's also instructions that you can access on how to fill that out. We do also have a whole new suite of tools and resources on how to align that high school and beyond plan with the IEP transition plan. And I hope you'll take a look at those because they're actually really great ideas for all students, not just our students who have IEPs. And then our Career Guidance Washington curriculum is still available. It is still needing to be updated to align with the pathways, but there's lots of good guidance there still in those lesson plans, and you can use whatever works for you. And in January, we also should have our updated High School and Beyond template so that you can see sort of how we're framing what could be in a High School and Beyond plan, and then again, pick and choose what works for you. And then last but certainly not least, I wanted to link you directly to all the financial aid resources and information that our partners at WASAC are producing for you. Again, they are your go-to agency for all of the FAFSA and WASFA information that will need to be shared out with all students. So with that, we have just a couple minutes for some questions, and I wanted to actually provide our agency lead for House Bill 1599 implementation is Catherine Mahoney. She's been here supporting this webinar She's going to answer a few questions for us from what she's been seeing in the chat. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for spending your lunch hour with us as we've been trying to get you as much information as possible. Our Q&A window has been popping. A lot of the questions regarding the path were, were quite specific, uh, and I want to zoom out for just one minute to reaffirm the purpose of the pathway and what the law says the purpose of the pathway is. The purpose of the pathway is to have something in place for the student that is aligned with their goal that is in the high school and beyond plan. So uh, examples of questions we're getting are, if a student ha does a student have to take a bridge course their senior year if they did not meet the SGA requirement, but they did complete a CTE grad pathway? The answer to that is, if a student has met the CTE grad pathway requirements, we would expect to see that that student has a goal that would be served by a CTE grad pathway requirement. So a student does not have to do a transition course if they are not meeting the graduation score on a SBA, ELA, or math test. But if their goal really requires that ELA or math pathway, so for example, they're really only focused on a pathway that requires them to go through a general education post-secondary experience, the CTE grad pathway may or may not get them there. So the question is, it, or the answer is, it depends. So as you're thinking about, do these pathways work for our students or do they not work for our students? The first pivot is always back to what goal does a student have? And this, those CTE pathways are not constricted to math and ELA. So students who are meeting those pathways, if they didn't meet the math and ELA assessment standards, if they've met a CTE pathway, they've met a pathway. They're good to go, right? Yep, as long okay. as it's aligned with their high school and beyond plan goal. So for CTE, a lot of questions. I will tell you that this is going to be something that's hard for our entire system because for so many of us, we, we kind of think about CTE and we say, huh, we're, we don't know much about CTE. The good news is you actually have people in your district who do know a lot about CTE. So one of your first pivots is gonna be back to your CTE director or your CTE lead at your district or building level because a lot of the questions we're getting are like, can you define terms and can you tell us what the difference between a sequence and a program area is? And we can do that really briefly, but those types of questions are things that your CTE folks know in and out. The, the rule is two credits of sequential coursework. A skill center would in fact meet that requirement, even though it might look like a single course, it is three credit. And so skill centers are really great options for students who are looking at a CTE grad pathway to meet their post-secondary goal. We are running a process to develop a list of industry-recognized credentials that will be allowable for 
CTE grad pathways. Those will be published in time for the 2020-21 school year. For this year, your districts have already been noting industry recognized credentials for students that are kind of locally determined and you'll continue doing that for this year in this class. When that list is published, what you will see is that there will be two different groups of cert certifications on that list. One will be certifications that can be earned by a student through high school instruction, and another will be credentials that a student would be on the path to earning likely after graduation, but that the high school instruction gets them on that path and leads to, which is the language in the statute, leads to an industry recognized credential. So those are some of the CTE questions that we were getting. I encourage you, our CTE directors uh, across the state have been working this issue since we started drafting this law in, in January and, and February of last year and are a really good resource for many of these questions. But I know it is hard for those of us who have not spent a lot of time in the CTE world to, to feel confident that we know what's happening here. So some brief answers there. One other question that we got that's not related to CTE, but is related to the expedited waiver options for the class of 2020. There will be updated guidance posted in January around accessing that expedited waiver. Nothing has changed content-wise around what works for those waivers since 2019. So the types of things that are statute for that waiver process is admissions to a college, a scholarship, to a college. And then there's still a, what looks like kind of the military and the dual credit pathway. There's some differences maybe between the new pathways and the old military process for the expedited waiver or the dual credit pathway for that expedited waiver that we'll be teasing out in that guidance in January. But for the most part, the, the two that are different from the pathways would be that we're continuing to accept admissions to a college or a scholarship to a post-secondary institution. We hope that the information we have provided has given you enough to go back and start working through the specifics of what you want to build for your students. I think the biggest thing I hope you take out of this is that we are here to help you. What our whole agencies are geared towards right now is providing you with the assistance that you need. Our goal is to have for you by next Wednesday at the latest a link to this webinar and an FAQ of all the questions that were asked today that we couldn't answer, but that we know you want the information for. Oh, I just want to thank everybody who signed on again and reiterate that it's our goal to provide as many resources and answer as many questions for you as, as you can. I wanted to reiterate and thank those who are um, done and can go back to your day jobs. Thank you, everybody.